what's fascinating to me is as a company goes past maybe 10, 20 people, 50 people, it's a beautiful moment when it takes on a bit of a life of its own culturally, and then it becomes a magnet for the right people. And if you can steer and guide that culture the right way, then you attract the people that have those kind of shared values and the, and the kind of common aims. And then actually a lot of things become a lot easier. That's been partly my experience. A lot of the motivation that I have to bring or the, the kind of agenda setting that I have to do is easier because there's cultural momentum. Hi there, and welcome to the Ben Morton Leadership Podcast. It's the weekly show that brings you inspiring interviews with senior leaders and genuine subject matter experts, all designed to help you be the very best leader you can possibly be. It's my gift to you, and it's completely free. In today's episode, we sit down with Tim Kresik, a visionary leader who is the CEO and founder of Vorboss. London's only dedicated business fibre network and internet service provider. Tim's journey is nothing short of remarkable. He initially launched Vorbos as a software consultancy and managed service provider in 2006. However, it was in 2019 that he recognised the limitations of London's existing internet providers and infrastructure in the business district. It was this realisation that propelled him to transform the telecom sector. Since 2020, Vorbos, now part of the Fern Trading Group, has invested over £300 million into a full fibre network, providing businesses with direct access to essential fibre infrastructure, accompanied by transparent pricing. The company has laid over 500 kilometres of fibre optic cable connecting all commercial buildings in central London, creating an unrivaled network in terms of both scale and quality. In this episode of the show, we talk about his definition of leadership and how he has developed his skills throughout his career. We touch on the often quoted line that leadership is a lonely job and our shared experiences of that challenge. And if that isn't enough, we also talk about the challenges of scaling a company from 25 to 400 employees in just two years and maintaining the culture. That's enough of an introduction though, so let's dive right in. Sit back, relax and enjoy my interview with Tim Kresik. Tim, a very warm welcome to the show. Hi, Ben. Nice to meet you. Tim, if I've understood your career background, you left university before graduating and almost immediately went ahead and founded Vorbos in one of its early guises. You then did loads of internships, but other than your own business, you've never had a full-time job, so to speak. And that being the case, I'm always curious about how lifelong entrepreneurs such as yourself go about developing and building their leadership skills. So that being the case, it seems like a great place to start would be to ask, what does leadership mean to you? Uh, It's a really good question. I think there were definitely some full-time jobs in there and plenty of kind of summer jobs and other things. But I think I was very lucky early on to maybe get a good understanding of good leadership in some of those things I did. But for me, it's about leading from the front. It's about fairness. It's about inspiring people to do better. And I think it's also about having the evidence that the things that you're doing are helping people achieve more than they would achieve on their own. I think otherwise, you sort of have, as a leader, maybe have to question what your role is. It's not just to direct people, but it's actually to help extract more than they would achieve without you there. Mm. And has that view of leadership evolved as you've grown and the business has, has changed to sort of its shape and direction and purpose? I think everything has to evolve almost every day for me in, in this role. I'm, I'm sort of always learning. That's the best part, right? My, my job, I've never had two days the same, I suppose. And I've said to people here many times, every day I turn up to work, you know, in a growing company, I've, I've never run a company this big before. So I always kind of have that pressure on myself of, of trying to do better, trying to learn, always trying to kind of respond. But I think one, one thing that sort of really springs to mind when I, I used to teach sailing when I was younger, I was a qualified sailing instructor when I was 17. And I think that's probably where I learned some of the most valuable leadership lessons and a lot that stick with me 
all the way today, you know, things that come up almost on a daily basis. I was very lucky to be exposed to that. And one of the things I alluded to as well about extracting performance, that was a job that really kind of pushed me to be much better really showed me that I could I could do a lot more than I'd actually initially thought. So I think I was very lucky to have a lot of very good leadership lessons early on. Mm. And what were some of those formative lessons that you took from that period when you was a sailing instructor? Because I'm sure people listening, they won't necessarily make a obvious link between the two. So what is it that you really took from that period that you've carried with you? I think everyone's probably got a moment in their career where they've where they kind of remember getting told off. And I think <laughs> the first time someone kind of set you right, you know, I had a, a former colleague who said, you know, it was for him, it was it was working in a law firm and someone telling him that the shoes he was wearing were just not appropriate, you know, and it was that kind of awkward conversation right. that no one really wanted to have to have with him, but someone had to have it. And ever since then, he kind of, it then made him aware that actually being you know, professionally presented in front of clients was really important, but it just wasn't on his radar. And I think we all have those little gaps of things that somehow we sort of, innocently out of ignorance just didn't know about or didn't do and for me it was one that sticks with me and I still cringe about it but it was my habit when I was working in the sailing school was, was it was about half an hour on the train to get there in the morning I've never been a morning person but I would quite often fall asleep on the train on the way there arrive I'd walk past this corner kind of corner shop and I would buy some breakfast and then I would eat it on the way or as I was arriving and I got taken aside by Steph, who, who owned the sailing school, and she gave me a proper bollocking about like not eating my breakfast in front of clients. She's like, it's not a good look when you're here, you're responsible for them, and you're eating your breakfast. And I sort of tried to, I'm trying to defend it and be like, but this is just when I like to eat my breakfast. And her point was kind of, it makes you look unprepared. Mm-hmm. You know, I know you do it every day. To them, first time they're seeing you, it looks like you're running late today. You know, at that point, I was like, okay, whatever. And then it was the follow up from her, which was like, I don't want to see you do that again. And then it was like, oh, yeah, okay, you're my boss. I, I need to listen. And then, as I said, it sort of that opened my eyes to a lot of the optics. I hadn't really thought about what did my behavior say and the way I was presented and all the rest of it. What did that say to someone who was turning up to the sailing school that morning? Maybe a little nervous, maybe a little apprehensive. Maybe it's a windy day. Maybe they're a bit worried that it could be dangerous or whatever. And what did everything I was doing kind of communicate to them that I hadn't considered? And so, it, it, yeah. Just a really interesting one, but also one of those things where it's like just getting set straight by someone, you know, sometimes it is that simple. Yeah. Do you know what? It's really interesting. I've got a very similar story myself. So when I was in the military and I deployed to Iraq for the second time, so I was mid twenties, a captain in charge of about 180 soldiers. And now this is maybe because at this point I decided I was going to leave the army, but even though it was in Iraq, we still had to do fitness training early in the morning. And up until that point, standards were probably starting to slip within our squadron. And about three months into that deployment, we had a new OC, officer commanding, take command of our unit. And there was one morning when we was getting up for our early morning PT, and me and one of the lieutenants who I shared a room with probably arrived on the PT parade about one minute to six. Now, there's this whole thing in the military that on time is five minutes before, and probably half the squadron were there already. Our new boss was there. This was literally one of his first few days in Iraq with us. And in front of everybody, he called me and this lieutenant out for being late. And to your point, it was absolutely cringeworthy and horrible, like almost almost humiliating, but not quite. And I'd always prided myself on being on time, all of that good stuff. I've never been late for anything ever since because those lessons like really hit you and sink in don't they so I can really appreciate where you're coming from there Tim this is a somewhat tangential question but it's linked to your comment there about eating breakfast in front of clients what's your view on people eating lunch at their desk oh that's a that's a minefield isn't it (laughs) it is I don't have one uh really like I I'm I'm completely guilty of it my slightly obsessive personality, and I'm sure there's people going to listen to this and, and scoff when I say that, my, my slightly obsessive personality is, is that I would rather kind of work through my lunch. I don't expect other people to do it. I don't expect everyone to do it. But for me, it's like I'm doing something. I want to get it done. I'm kind of in work mode. I don't want to take an hour out, wander off and go and sit in a cafe yeah. in the middle of the work day. Like I I've, I've kind of want to work in a big block of time, get as much done as I can. And then actually I've got really good discipline about how I separate my kind of work and personal life. And, and I don't work at home and I don't, you know, I, I do, when I leave the office, I, I do park what I'm doing and it's 
you know, one of the sort of greatest pleasures of having been reasonably successful is, you know, with a smaller business, you don't get that luxury. And then you kind of get to a point where you have a, a well enough established organization that the test becomes you shouldn't be involved in everything. And so actually, it's it's a real privilege to be in a position where I can sort of switch off at the end of the day. So for me, it's it's a funny one because I'm quite intense when I'm at work and, and that period from when I arrive to when I leave is full on. And so for me, it's a little odd to sort of switch that halfway through. I don't really have a view on it. I suppose my only point is like, if it becomes unbelievably messy, but I feel like if it's if it's something that you can easily eat at a desk without it being weird, uh, I'm, I'm okay with it. <laughs> but I will I will draw the line, like it, it does annoy me a little bit if people want to eat in meetings. You know, that's like, there are certain meetings where like everyone will kind of bring lunch and that's okay. And we'd have a couple of leadership meetings like that. But yeah, I do get a little annoyed if someone wants to like bring their lunch to a meeting and it's like three o'clock. Yeah, interesting. Coming back to how you've, evolved and grown as a as a leader what has your approach to that been have you been a student of 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 life have you invested in courses programs have you worked with coaches how have you continued to develop your skills there for a good decade or so like I, I just was like hoovering up business books you know and and just reading and reflecting and I and I think I've always been quite keen to digest that stuff and and not just the kind of the normal tomes as well but also a little bit of popular psychology i've always been really interested in in kind of how people work and understanding and motivating people and that side of it to me is just super interesting so i think that's that's always been for me a natural part so i think i was reading a lot i definitely have that sort of mindset of experimentation as well so i think being really self-critical trying things seeing what works i'm not someone who dwells on the past but i i am always trying to kind of see what what are the learned opportunities like how do, how do I sort of do the best going forward so I think I was lucky that the team that I've built grew very gradually to begin with so I didn't sort of jump in with loads and loads of people to manage early early on you know I think that's you know the military is a great example where suddenly you can find yourself with 100 people to take care of with relatively little experience and I think uh, I didn't have that problem so I think I was able to kind of learn very honestly learn by doing and learn with people that I'd sort of chosen to work with who you know, particularly when you're hiring into a very small team, like four or five people in your company, it's almost natural that you hire people that you think are going to be easy to work with. And mm-hmm. I think you learn together then. So I was I was very lucky. I had, you know, probably a decade of being able to read a lot of things, try a lot of things, and learn the lessons in actually probably quite a safe environment. And we'll talk about books towards the end of the episode. But as soon as you mentioned it there, were there any particular books or maybe biographies of leaders that were particularly impactful for you and shaped you as a leader i think like my answer to that every year would probably be different there's always sort of right. been one that was maybe top of mind or something because i think one of the things i've, I've tended to do is be quite self-aware of where i've got issues or where I, you know or not maybe me but like organizationally where we've got work to do and then i've tended to seek out the resource for that so it's changed variously i mean i think Early on, I think even when I was at university, I probably read, it's not really even a management book, but The Mythical Man Month. The subheading is a collection of essays on software engineering. You know, that's coming up to, I think, 50 years old now, that book. And that was really interesting just in terms of understanding the dynamics of how large teams can often be way less productive than small teams. And and that sort of triggered a whole load of thoughts for me about the various uh, elements of that. But even before that, I think, you know, my dad had always sort of talked about I don't think my dad was necessarily a natural manager of people. So as a kid, he would he would sort of talk to me about management and the challenges of management. Right. But almost in the way of, of, of sort of the things that he had found counterintuitive or difficult. And so I I kind of heard concepts like the Peter principle and managing by walking about and kind of mm-hmm. so a lot of like the, the early stuff I had on management was all like 1970s kind of era management stuff. And then I actually went back probably in my late teens early 20s and and actually went and read some of the books and sort of started to understand yeah really just out of curiosity like started to understand that long before i had people to manage you know i remember uh, we had an assignment I, I studied engineering but one of the assignments we had was to write an essay on management funnily enough like i i was massively over researched it i kind of used that as an opportunity to then go and dig out all these books and all these things so all these little bits i'd heard but never really tried to apply a structure to I I then went and kind of read all these books and it was and that was for me was really interesting because that was when I really started to and I had a few case studies of you know things that had worked and things that were very toxic in certain companies so yeah not necessarily any particular standout books and then more recently we've kind of gone into this era where like the kind of the culture of the founder CEO and and it's like a lot more acceptable now I think to be an entrepreneur it's a lot more it's it's a 
you know you can you can meet a 18 year old who tells you they want to be an entrepreneur and like people don't laugh at them whereas i think when i started that was that was a very different it was like why why do you want to be different then that maybe tackles this other side which is maybe some of the loneliness of it so probably one of the most impactful ones for me in that context was was actually reading shoe dog phil knight's book right yeah over several chapters he kind of explains that it took more than 10 years to get any traction at this thing that he believed in and everyone forgets that and nike is a phenomenal brand and Mm. and is one of the most recognized logos on the planet but he spent 10 years banging his head against the wall and it was lonely as hell and everyone thought he was insane and i read that and i was like i know that inside out so i think there were some of those that were more introspective things that were very valuable to me it's so interesting you you share that story about nike because i did a solo podcast episode just recently reflecting on 10 years running this business and having done 135 odd podcasts now. And one of the big learnings I came up with is just, I think we need to be very careful about the comparators we pick, be that in terms of our business or ourselves. And Nike is a great example. We just see this amazing brand. So many of us forget the struggle and the time it took to reach that tipping point, right? And we can end up beating ourselves up, can't we? Because we're not achieving this amazingly high standard that we're setting for ourselves. It's, it's great to chase those companies, but if that's our comparator early on, it can set us up for a lot of pain and heartache, can't it? Yeah, and I think that was one of the things that was a relief to me because at the time that I read the book, I was pretty much 10 years into my journey. And and I don't think he'd even said it that way in the book. He, he referred to, it was just the date. So kind of naturally my mind was like, that's really interesting. So like the point that he actually got to whatever it was, $100,000 of, of recurring revenue or something, like something really small number, it was like 10 years from when he'd set out on the journey. And you're kind of like, that for me, I was like, wow, that's, that's immense. So, but there was also this sort of part where in that 10 years they had really been able to test a lot of things they but they'd learned the foundations and and actually what followed probably wouldn't have worked had the prior 10 years not happened the way it did if that makes sense you know that that period was so valuable for them to learn what mattered and to get a few things right that just hit really close to home you know 10 years into running my own business still it a handful of people you know i think revenue was in single certainly low single digit millions it you know we were not massively successful but had figured a huge number of things out and mm-hmm. and I, I think had established i've always sort of been a bit more of a believer in the character of an organization you know if you if you don't first stand for something then it's kind of pointless having the company at all so i think at that point we certainly knew what we stood for and that was really important you mentioned loneliness as well have you found it lonely being a founder and ceo how's that changed over the years and have you managed that yeah i think and loneliness might not be the right word but uh it is and even now where you know we're 400 people we have a lot more structure we have different company ownership with investors we have a board it's actually still quite lonely because you're you know on the one hand you sit in the boardroom and you carry the whole company with you into the room to report to the board and it's just you really and then concurrently you have that pressure of carrying the expectations of the investor and the board into your business and being where the buck stops on all of that as well. So it ends up being this perversely quite lonely role because you have a huge amount of contact, but in no, no transaction is there a, is there a true balance. Like in every, in every sort of element of it, you're sort of out on your own a little bit. Prior to that as a small business, it's just that where the buck stops part. I think I was recently actually <laughs> speaking to a group of business study students at my, at my old high school. One of them Ask the question of what should he do if he if he thinks he wants to to be an entrepreneur and wants to start a business? What would I recommend as as the path? And you know, ap- apart from my sort of glib thing of don't do it. That's what I was going to say. Did you uh, say don't do it? I always say don't do it. He he then went on to sort of offer up. He was like, well, should I go and do a load of internships? You know, I can. Should I go and do a bunch of internships, like in sort of consulting, and maybe go and do a business studies degree, and then go and do. I do a business degree, then I'm going to do a bunch of internships and like, and, and what level of internship should I do? Should I go and try and be like an aide or a, a assistant to a CEO or whatever? Like what's going to give me the right exposure? I thought like, brilliant question, because you're actually sort of asking yourself, like, how do I get there? And I, and I it took me a moment actually to, to actually kind of conclude the advice I gave for better or worse was put yourself in a position where you actually have the accountability. So my experience has been and and also 
being around a lot of startups and a lot of other entrepreneurs and people who started businesses, the one thing that there doesn't appear to be a test for or any training for is whether you are the sort of person that is okay at eight o'clock at night being where the buck stops when everyone else has gone home mm -hmm. because they need to get to their family, they're late for a dinner, um, they're tired and they just can't think anymore and they've all gone and you're sat there on your own and the work needs to be delivered by 9 a.m. tomorrow morning and there is no one else to go to. It's you, the bank account, and the paychecks you have to write that week. And I had that experience really early on and not everyone's cut out for it. Like it's not a pleasant experience. Now you, you can sort of take it a number of ways, but you have to get comfortable with it. You have to get comfortable that that, that is the lonely moment. And then when that, you have it the first time, it then never leaves you because you're always aware, even on the best days, these people are all going to leave you at some point. Uh, you know, they're going to eventually have something in their hierarchy of needs that trumps this this job. And as the founder, the other thing that makes it very lonely is you probably don't. You know, you, you know, I certainly lost relationships over my business because when it came down to it, I felt more accountability to making sure I could pay my employees or that I didn't want to throw away five, six years of work. I would leave parties to solve problems that customers had because we were running kind of a 24-7 operation. You know, I lost friends, I lost relationships, like, because you have to make the decision, like, what's important? And then once you've decided what's important, you have to prioritize it. And you also have to accept as the founder that probably no one else in your life will share that priority in the same way. And so that is that is a lonely kind of existence. Yeah, I find this fascinating. So you're around about 20 years right into running your business? Yeah, 18 coming up to. Cool. I'm at the 10 year point. And listening to you speak there, it really resonated this piece around where the buck actually stops and are you comfortable? Can you be comfortable with whatever time at night if something needs doing, you you have to do it. And the stuff that ultimately everything rests on your shoulders, right? I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with that. But I think as time goes on, I become less uncomfortable with it. What's that look like for you? Yeah, it's like it's like you just get used to having the monkey on your back, right? Like it's yeah. you you carry it around with you everywhere. That I mean, I suppose I don't have children. I suppose in many ways it's probably like having children. That even when they've left home, you kind of know out there somewhere you're probably still accountable for somebody. That you could receive a phone call and need to drop everything. And I, and I sort of hate myself for having chosen that because I I've, the other bit is whenever people refer to the business as like your baby, uh, that drives me nuts because I because I've always been quite transactional about it. I'm very proud of what I've built, but the aim is always to build something so well that it stands on its own so to have that kind of strong connection for me is not is not right but i think you have to be a fairly normal person that never sits comfortably there are definitely people out there that for whatever reason they, they're kind of their mental state is they're okay they just totally disregard that accountability but i think actually yeah, it's uh, to your point it you just get better at understanding that that is what you've you've got to do yeah it's interesting you say a fairly normal person as well I, I forget the exact stat but there is some research that says there is an a very high percentage of fortune 500 ceos who are somewhere on the psychopath spectrum and like not all psychopaths kill people in the shower with a big knife right but not all ceos are normal yeah and i mean listening to um Walter Isaacson this morning uh, as I was getting ready uh, discussing Elon Musk and I think again that's sort of top of mind was like his need for like high pressure environments so that sort of as soon as he feels like something's under control needing to open up a new line of inquiry and, cre and create more pressure and create and create more more challenge and and some of that I certainly identify with of like I enjoy pushing myself so I think there's for me that's probably got more to do with it is is like pushing myself and being able to look back and go that was that was cool I I, I exceeded in many ways, I exceeded my expectations. Like, I think I've always had quite modest expectations, but high hopes, if that makes sense. And then it's like, I'll push myself, but I won't necessarily be disappointed. So I've never been, I don't, I don't get disappointed by sort of underachieving because at least I tried. How does that translate into leadership then when you're setting goals and objectives for individuals, functions within the organization? Is that something you have to consciously work at because of that personality trait you've just described? One of the things that's actually really interesting and that we're navigating at the moment is, is sort of figuring out to what extent you're a high performing organization and then you and then you become a selector for certain character types. So so you kind of look at it and go, well, actually, we should seek out people who are who are similar. And and again, if you want to take the Musk example, it was sending an email to everybody at Twitter saying, you know, you're either hardcore or there's probably a better job for you. But I don't want the people in between. And I think it's really interesting. Like we're not we're not on that end of the spectrum, but 
I think the idea that what's fascinating to me is as a company goes past maybe 10, 20 people, 50 people, it's a beautiful moment when it takes on a bit of a life of its own culturally, and then it becomes a magnet for the right people. And if you can steer and guide that culture the right way, then you attract the people that have those kind of shared values and the, and the kind of common aims. And then actually a lot of things become a lot easier. That's been partly my experience. A lot of the motivation that I have to bring or the, the kind of agenda setting that I have to do is easier because there's cultural momentum in the organization and that mm. attracts people and actually it even attracts them with an increasing kind of strength as well. So that's been quite good fun. I don't have to do too much of that. And then the only other part, I suppose, is I've never really been good at berating people for poor performance. Uh, and again, I'm sure people listen to this and, and call me out on that. But I think um, <laughs> I said earlier, I don't, I don't like spending time kind of dwelling on the past too much. And so, you know, I'm always willing to stand back and go like that was guys this was a shit piece of work like we all need to but we all need to own it right like if it happened in my organization i am as responsible as the person who made the mistake or screwed it up or you know produced the poor output so we need to all just get behind the fact that like let's please agree this was terrible and never do it again that's not me telling you off that's me hopefully guiding us all into a you know a better place i think that's the only other sort of key thing for me is or where i maybe notice that i'm quite different is i don't fixate on those things to the extent that I hurry have like one or two stereotypical entrepreneurial traits, the other is no matter what happens, there's a very short period of time between delivering me bad news and my mind starting to figure out what the angle is, what the, what's the opportunity. Best example there is, you know, having someone quit. So years ago, you know, someone who was really, you know, four or five people in the company, someone who was probably my most technical person had taken a lot of my plate was great to have around like was carrying a huge weight of the organization out of the blue on a tuesday afternoon sits me down and goes i've accepted another job and this is my one month's notice genuinely in less than 60 seconds i've taken what was kind of a bombshell and and my mind is already like okay this is actually a huge opportunity because i can now completely restructure the way this role works and actually yeah okay it's going to be really annoying for three months but now what I can do is like this person was kind of an organizational bottleneck. They were almost too good. This other person can be promoted. They can take on more because I think they were being held back. And actually I can restructure that role and I could hire two people and I could kind of take it a slightly different direction because it's, you know, every time you, you lose people, there's also an opportunity there. But that's been the same. You know, COVID was a similar situation. Like this is terrible, but also there will be winners here. And I know it's kind of an awful thing to say, but like your role as the, as the leader of business is to see it through, right? So, mm. you know, and I think those are the, those for me have always been the kind of interesting things of the extent to which you can take something bad and find the opportunity in it. So is that naturally you or is that something you've worked at developing, that, that mindset and outlook? I, I've always been like that. I think I've always been that sort of opportunist, I suppose. I'm a systems thinker and I enjoy that balance of like, there's something bad, but that must mean there's a, there's a, there's someone will win or there is a change, you know, there's a, there's a perturbation in the system. What are the consequences? So maybe, maybe now it's a little bit more like I would identify that as opportunity. I think previously it was maybe a more thorough process of like, there's a change. What are all the consequences of the change? And then having thought about all the consequences going, oh, that's interesting. So that actually, that's an opportunity. Whereas now I probably jump more quickly to like, well, I'm not interested in things that aren't opportunities. Given the change, given high interest rates, given a pandemic, given these weather conditions, given an energy shortage. Okay, cool. But like, what does that change? What are the win? Who are the winners? Yeah, that makes sense. And something you said a few moments back loops us nicely back to something I wanted to ask you in particular. So now over the past few years, you've grown the business from what, 25 people or so up to being in the region of 400. What have been some of the major challenges on that journey? There's so much stuff, right? And then at the same time, very little, because actually to that point around the 10 years of figuring out who you are, that bit in the wilderness is really valuable. One of the most significant things that we sort of said or did was, you know, as we were sitting there having closed a very large fundraise and looking down the barrel of a business plan that meant that we had to hire north of 200 people in a year you know into a very small team that had been working together really effectively and just had just well actually was at the tail end of the pandemic so we just kind of seen our way through that so we had a really good bond and i think one of the most effective things i said was it's actually not that hard to hire 200 people what's going to be hard is hiring 200 people and still wanting to turn up to work the next day when we're done you know when we walk into this office 
And it was helpful because we the first thing we did was move to a much bigger office. There were 25 of us knocking around this massive office with 200 desks in it. And, and it was a really nice visual metaphor. I was like, look around. Imagine this place in three years' time is going to be teaming with people. And you're going to have to come in in the morning and you're going to have to want to be here. So let's please make sure that we hire people in a way that makes us want to still work here when we're done. And it's such, that was such a simple thought. And, and I genuinely think that was probably the one thing that overwhelmingly influenced the two years that followed. Yeah, that's interesting. And Tim, I think linked to that last question, people often talk about maintaining culture, especially when an organization is is growing. And I absolutely think a lot of the time maintaining the culture is the right thing to do. But so long as it's intentional and we've thought about the culture that we actually need, because the culture we need in a high growth startup, maybe in the first naught to five, seven years, isn't necessarily the same culture we need to deliver the strategy that's going to give us continued growth in years 10 to 20, right? That being said, like what's the culture that Vorbos needs right now and what are you doing to build or maintain it? So I think, I think, you know, it touched on high performance, like a high performing culture. You know, we're still a growth organization. We're still dealing with the unknown. You know, it's a, probably a tired metaphor, but, you know, it's, it's a useful one. It's, it's like we're still in that kind of moonshot mode where right. we've got something to prove. You know, I'm always fascinated that all that stuff around the, the kind of the Apollo program, putting man on the moon. It's such a lovely example of like how a, a enormous group of people can be galvanized around what, a singular, very clear aim you know, and, and those sort of anecdotes that come out of, you know, them asking, so, you know, asking the cleaner, what, what is it you do? And he's like, I'm putting man on the moon. You know, there's something valuable in that because it shows such a good understanding of the goal. But there's also great examples in there of sort of so many wonderful leadership things. And the other one I really kind of take away is this ability for people to understand how to sort of, given what we're trying to do, understand how that translates to what I need to do today in order to make us succeed. And then the other bit is is just being very comfortable that there were so many unknowns in the process that it didn't change the clear understanding of what the next step was. You know, the next step was we need to figure out how to get something really big into orbit. And then the next step is we need to figure out how to dock two spacecraft, how to actually rendezvous yeah. two spacecraft in orbit. This is hard, right? They knew they were miles away from the problem of like getting to the moon and then landing on the moon, and then getting off the moon, and all the things, you know, they hadn't even designed the spacesuit yet. And I think that idea of like, that's okay, I can get my head down and focus on the next problem, because no matter what happens, we have to solve that. And I can't see my way to the finish line, but that's okay. I can still work on the thing that's most important. So culturally, having people who are really high performers, but also have that intersection with they're comfortable not being able to see their way to the finish line, but have the confidence that like the team will get there and that it must be possible and conceptually it's possible, even if I can't see every step to the finish. And and actually that's quite a rare, people who are comfortable in that environment, are, are, I, I've discovered to be something relatively rare. But if, if I may, on the point of culture, I think I'd probably go a step further and say, I really think of my role and what we do as a business is is building culture first and and the business plan second. I sort of feel the other way around. Like if you get the team right, and you get the culture right, then you can almost go and do anything. You know, then it's then yes, there's a selection of of you know what are the skills you've hired, but actually, if you get those fundamentals right, and so I, I think I I sort of massively over-index on the cultural stuff because I think as long as I get that bit right, I can kind of fix the rest. We can train people, we can teach people, we can do all sorts of stuff, and we can all learn. But fundamentally, like you can't make somebody not an asshole. That's really tough. And if they don't like the unknown you're never going to make them comfortable with it, really. So I think those are the things that we, I say sort of say we over-index on, but I feel like in assembling the right team, then then lots of problems start to look very solvable. If you don't have the right team, that's just never going to work. Tim, one final main question before I ask you a few quickfire ones to finish up. And this is slightly becoming a tradition on the show, and it's slightly abstract. If you were the host of this podcast interviewing Tim, what question would you ask yourself? It's probably where does it end? It's probably really macabre. People who work closely with me know that I spend a lot of time talking about death. I sort of have that mathematician thing of take any equation and feed in zero, feed in infinity and sort of test it for its limits. I think a lot of what I do day to day and a disproportionate amount of time in therapy has been spent discussing. I always like to apply that perspective of if I, if I imagine myself lying on my deathbed with a, a week to fondly look back over my life, how will I feel about this moment? Will it seem significant? Mm -hmm. 
you know, because we can get so stressed and worry about things that actually when I'm 80, 90, 100, whatever it might be years old, looking back, I won't even remember that this was a thing, let alone how stressful it is today. Or I might look back and it'll make me smile or laugh or I'll feel sad about it or I'll wish I'd behave differently. And so I find for me that framing is really helpful. So on the one hand, I think about this a lot, but then I don't necessarily have in my own mind where I'm trying to go, which is mm. odd because I, I spend so much time dwelling on the future, but not with a sense of my own path through it. Yeah. Have you read 4,000 Weeks? Did that come out of some some blog posts? Because I think I read some of the original blog posts or, or something around that, but yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure the origins of the book, but the premise is the average person, average life expectancy, early to mid 80s, which roughly translates to 4,000 weeks on this on this planet. And how do we use them? How do we decide what's of value and what's not? And in some ways, it's almost anti-time management. Like this concept of trying to get it all done is a fool's errand because it's like climbing an infinitely long ladder. The faster and more efficient we get about climbing the ladder, it just grows. So we can get really great at clearing our inbox, but actually more will come in because people know we're really efficient. Yeah, and, and it's like one of the top management tips I give people who are transitioning from, I should come up with some language for this, but there's like, <laughs> it's like I kind of divide them into like achievable roles and unachievable roles. So like leadership roles tend to be unachievable, right? There was always more you could do. And achievable yeah. roles is like, I'm responsible for chasing payments or I'm responsible for payroll. You know, like it absolutely is fully contained and actually not delivering it is highly problematic, right? But like the whole role is achievable. And then you get into like, now I'm responsible for a whole division or a whole part of the company or I'm responsible for the commercial activities or new products. And and there's always more you could do, right? And I've noticed that's a tough transition for a lot of people when they go from these like the finite world of like everything could be on a list and I can prioritize it and I can triage it and it's all done. And I go home at the end of the week, the month, whatever, the quarter, and I've, I've everything's got a bow on it. And when those people transition into these like unachievable roles where there's always more, a lot of them I've, I've noticed really struggle. And the way I try and rationalize it is it's like what you have to get very good at is you're going to come to work every day. You need to decide what you're not going to do. And it's kind of defeating when, you know, the first year, month, whatever of, of doing it, it's like, it's awful. Because if you're someone who's used to being able to get everything done, it's really really tough but kind of as you've said like once you realize and once you and once you get into this it's it's actually really empowering because then you realize mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff you can just ignore yeah. it's noise that's distracting you from the big stuff and from and from really moving things forward and actually there will always be enough things to fill your agenda that you'll never then really get to decide the direction you're going in if you just always do the stuff that's in front of you yeah it's a great point that I just for the benefit of everybody listening i'd just like to reinforce with a couple of stories from friends of mine so two friends who are still in the military were talking to me about their experiences being a commanding officer, which is equivalent to being an MD or CEO of a probably 600-person organization. One of the roles you do before that is what's called an officer commanding. So there you're in charge of probably 120 people. And they both said, when you're an OC, you can pretty much cover up the cracks going on in your organization by just working harder and doing stuff yourself. Then you get promoted to a commanding officer and there's so much coming at you that you can't, but you try. And one friend in particular said a couple of months in, his boss, so a, a brigadier, very senior in the military, said, hey, let's call him Dave, how are you finding it? And he answers, no, Dave, how are you really finding it? And he went, to be honest, sir, I'm struggling trying to get everything done. I'm finding it quite stressful. And what his boss, this really senior guy then said, said it really caught him off guard. He went, but Dave, it's only stressful if you try to do everything. And this is the guy who's passing a lot of the work down. And he said, I don't expect you to, to do everything. But that is the danger, isn't it? When we get promoted, we try and be over everything. And we have to decide what we're going to let go, not do, where 70% is good enough and where it needs to be 100%. That's one of the big shifts, I think. No, absolutely. And, and you have to and you have to get really comfortable making those decisions and driving them and not just reacting, not just getting there and being so snowed under that, you know, you're now doing it out of sort of stress, but actually proactively getting out in front of it and going, no, I'm not going to do that. And then making sure the people around you understand that and also understand the reasoning. It's not that I'm lazy or that I don't care. 
it is that my role is to drive this organization forward. And honestly, whether this happens or not is not important in the context of where we end up in 10 years. So yeah. it's just not where I'm going to get my focus. Find another way to do it. Tim, a couple of quick fire questions to finish up. What would you say is the one item other than your smartphone that you would immediately replace if the original were to be lost, broken or stolen? Yeah, that's really tough. I think I'd be at a loss without my dog, but I don't think it really works to try and replace my dog. So I, I'm kind of, I'm on the fence on that one. But yeah, I think she comes everywhere with me. She's she's not in here right now, but uh, probably my dog. Yeah, I tried having my dog in the podcast studio. Really doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. And final question, Tim. We touched on this early, but let me ask again. What would you say is the one book that has had the most impact upon you? I probably will go back and, and say it was Shoe Dog. There's a lot that might be wrong with it, but I think for when I read it, where I was in, in my journey and, and kind of what that book did, that was probably the most influenced I was by a book in, in the last 15 years. Amazing. Tim, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a fabulous conversation. I've taken a lot from it, and I know all of the listeners are going to get a great deal of value from it too. So thanks very much for your time. It's amazing, Ben. Thank you too. I have a few things for you before you go. First of which is to say thank you for joining us both on this thought-provoking episode of the show. I really hope it resonated with you and created some valuable insights for you. Tim's thoughts around loneliness when we dropped deep into that topic were particularly valuable for me. And I really encourage you to share this episode with any friends or colleagues who are stepping into very senior leadership roles. I think there are some real pearls of wisdom in there that can help anyone in that situation. And before you go, do go ahead and take a look at my new delegation mastery program via the link in the show notes. It's the most comprehensive online program I've ever created. And I know that you and your team will get huge value from it. So do go ahead and click on that link in the show notes right now. Other than that, let me just say thank you once again for your continued support. And together, let's continue to make the world a better place through great leadership and effective delegation. Until next time, look after yourself. Look after those you've got the privilege and responsibility to lead. And as always, folks, lead on. Hold up. 